breakfast is far away, lunch beckons. You guys, uh, you know, we're going to have to try and keep this interesting. Uh, the default uh, extra member of every panel declared up to now is Lipika, so just let us have any questions about, you know, no alternative publishing or publishing itself. She's promised to stay till the end of the session, so all hostile questions of that, you know where to go. Lipika, there, there, next to the door. Block the exits. Alright, now we have that taken care of. Okay. Um, we had some trouble defining this session and what exactly is uh, you know alternate publishing. Two of the people on the panel plaintively said the email trail, but we don't do alternate publishing. So uh, we then we figured out ways in which everybody really is in some way working on alternatives. So I thought we'd just start out by just setting the ground a little bit here. Uh, perhaps starting with uh, you, Jitna. We can each go into, very briefly, your own particular experiences with conventional publishing, since we're talking alternatives, and what took you towards the alternatives. Hi. Um, I started with an e-magazine called Bubble Wrapped. Uh, basically, it caters to the NGO and CSR sector. Uh, it targets the Indian social sector and in terms of readers, I have a lot of young readers. Uh, the reason why I went in for an online version, one was commercial, somehow it takes a lot less in investment in terms of money to start something online versus doing something in print. Uh, number two, in terms of production, putting it together, it's far easier online, even in terms of coordinating with different parties like writers and designers. Uh, versus print. Uh, the other reason why I chose online again versus print was the reach. Where today with 2,000 readers, I have readers who are sitting in UK, US, the Middle East, New Zealand. Whereas if I had done 2,000 readers, uh, I mean 2,000 copies in print, I would be restricted only to Bombay City. So this is, I mean, that's that's somehow for me online works better than print because it's a lot more convenient. Uh, to start something, to get it going, as well as to reach out to people. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Vaishalki, and uh, uh, so I have experience with uh, you know, publishing role. Uh, actually, I had none. I mean, uh, you know, I, I like uh, Joyce Media, and I'm basically from software. But uh, always like to read. I mean, always like to read. And so, uh, this uh, evening hour actually started off as um, totally an adventure. I went hunting for a short story magazine, and uh, I think what's alternate about reading art is that we are in print, because most short story magazines are online. It, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of short stories online, and what I found was I could barely finish one, book, even though they were good. Somehow the experience was haunting. Uh, so then uh, we hunted for a print uh, short story magazine just uh, for some reason. I couldn't Hi, hello, I'm Eileen, and um, I don't think I've ever really been into traditional publishing at all, mainly because I don't really consider myself to be within the mainstream of, of anything at all. Um, what, I, I'm not really a publisher, we publish an online, have I long this views? No. We publish an online magazine called Transcript. It's a trilingual ma magazine published in English, French, and German. And the aim of that magazine is to enhance liter literary exchange among the smaller languages uh, of Europe. And when I say the smaller languages, I'm talking about substantial languages like Polish and Portuguese, etc. And also through our program called Literature Across Frontiers, 
we aim to enhance that exchange with the wider world as well. And so we have uh, collaborations with publishers and uh, translators and, and uh, other people who are part of the publishing chain in Turkey, in uh, Egypt, and also also in India. And we've uh, worked uh, with a number of people who are who are here today. And some of you might know Alexandra Buchler, who's, who's the director of Literature Across Frontiers. But what we see essentially is that multilingualism is the key to international literary exchange. This is the way in which I see the fact that I don't belong to a traditional uh, uh, context at all. And one of the challenges that we have when we look at uh, multilingual exchange is that very often there are, there are, it's not possible for literary or creative translators to make a living out of uh, various language combinations. And so what we've done is we've tried to create this network of 30 to 35 organizations that come together, we've prepared several uh, big European uh, bids, and what we've done there is we've created translator workshops as a methodology of trying to enhance uh, literary exchange through translation. So what we have is we have authors from different countries coming together, their work has been circulated to each other before the workshop, and then during the workshop they work on translating the text into their own languages, the text from each, each other's uh, context, so to speak. So that's the result of, if you like, a market failure on our behalf, because we don't have substantial markets in order to sustain the means by which literatures can be can reach new audiences, we have to find different ways of doing it. And the translation workshop methodology is one that we've, we've tried out. I think unlike um, the, the past three people we've heard from, um, I'm really from a background in what you'd call the sort of traditional heartlands of book publishing. Um, you know, very much, it's all about books and it's all about um, the, the paper and it's all very much um, the old school of publishing, the sort of archetype of publishing. Um, but what I really think about um, when I hear of alternate publishing is actually different formats and different forms of publishing. So although we've got magazine publishers here today, we've got book publishers here today, um, but actually to me, a publisher can be something much bigger, wider, more open and more flexible than just a book publisher or a magazine publisher. And I think that goes back to uh, the root of the word publishing in English, which is from the Latin public, to make something public. And so if we start thinking about publishing as simply the act of making something public, about bringing something to the public, we can suddenly see it in a much wider variety of contexts. So if you look at the games industry, you always have a development studio, and then you have a publisher. And likewise, in the record industry, you have the record company, and then you have a publisher. So actually, we can start thinking about publishing apps. We can publish music, we can publish games, we can publish websites, we can publish databases. Um, and I'll give you two examples of this. Firstly, the Oxford English Dictionary. They're probably never going to print another Oxford English Dictionary because it's just too big. What the OED is now is a database. Yet we'd still call Oxford University Press the publisher. Likewise, I'm sure you've all heard of Angry Birds, which is the game phenomenon for uh, mobiles um, created by a Finnish development studio called Rovio. However, when they first produced that game, they uh, partnered with a publisher, a games publisher called Chilingo. Um, and actually it was Chilingo that had a contact at Apple who then looked at the game, really liked it, and the, it, it spiraled off. So although that relationship between Chilingo and Rovio is over, the point there that I see is that there was, all, there was an intermediary. So alternate publishing, if we define ourselves as general cultural intermediaries, we can massively open up what we do and move into whole new different areas. Hi, I'm Maitri. In August 2008, a few months after Amazon uh, started Kindle, its e-reader, which completely altered the way that we read, we started a magazine in print which was called Kindles. And at that time, we thought that we were doing something alternative. Of course, not in technology, but in the kind of content that we were reading out, in the kind of alternate uh, 
distribution models that we were exploring, and also in the kind of alternate youth culture or a counter kind of counter culture that we wanted to create through the magazine. So for me, in this panel, alternate publishing would mean alternate content rather than alternate technology, and that's what I would like to discuss. Um, my reason for being here is also that uh, I played around a little bit with publishing, uh, but from two points of view, one is publishing when it comes to using the web to uh, publicize or to put out the things that you want to talk about. I was not a pioneering blog blogger, but I was an early adopter. Uh, friends of mine like Ilanjana, who was moderating the previous panel, were on it much earlier before everything. And I saw what they were doing and got onto that and found that a very useful way to uh, keep in touch with people, to write, to build a community, a number of things from there. I also, with a few friends, co-founded a forum for writers called Caparati, uh, which looked at the forum as a place, as a workshop, as uh, the, the internet as a 24-7, no geography boundaries workshop where uh, the accent was on peer review. You put a piece up, someone could, uh, you know, you could ask for feedback, that kind of thing. Uh, Caparati grew from there into uh, people, I mean, I'm one of those people who said online works so beautifully because we found that people wanted the physical space as well. So we have chapters in a number of cities where people do pretty much the same thing. At some point, we also published a book. Uh, we found that actually getting the, the writing done, for, as far as we were concerned, was easy. Uh, we had a contest, we got entries, we selected the best. Uh, from there, finding out how to, you know, the mechanics of it, we learned along the way. We got the book out eventually and uh, learned that we didn't know anything about distribution and getting the books out there. We tried to use the net, we sold some of it, and uh, we covered our costs in an unconventional way. Uh, we said, okay, where is it written that you cannot have an ad in a book? So we sold three or four ad spaces, which covered about half our production costs. And uh, so we were able to take a loss on actually selling the books and gave them away to a lot of people. If any of you are interested, I do have a few copies lying in my bag, so I can uh, show it to you if you like. I need to sell them to you because we still want to uh, you know, get some more money back. But yeah, so uh, those two fronts, one, one aspect of traditional publishing uh, per se, in which you could say that in some ways we failed, but in some ways we succeeded. And uh, the online world of blogs and forums, and which I also, as Michael said, it's all publishing, it's all publicizing. Uh, as well, reaching out to your public. Um, so I'm invested in that as well. And so really from here, again, taking it back to you guys, you've heard each other's stories right now, and I thought one particular but the, the, the point at which we can start conversing now is, uh, do you have questions for each other on what uh, has happened so far? So from here on, let's forget these guys and let's just talk. Sorry. <laughs> um, it, what's interesting to me is that um, it seems like there's a sort of a, a common problem um, here of, of uh, magazine, but everyone in publishing has exactly the same problem. They have content, there's an audience out there, and how do you put the content in touch with the audience? And um, what's also is, if you're doing uh, alternative content of any kind, then that just makes that uh, challenge harder because the audience is more depraved. Um, but it's, we've got two strategies. There's a print strategy and a digital strategy for um, fundamentally the same problem. Um, and I would think, is it not the best to go both at some level? So surely it's the, if we are um, pursuing a, uh, you know, this alternative content or this uh, difficult content um, even ordinary content, isn't it always best to have digital versions and uh, print versions? Because I think my philosophy is it, it, content should be totally platform neutral. It should be available wherever people can find it. Um, the reason why I don't intend going into print, uh, one is uh, money. It's too expensive. So for someone who's a small time independent entrepreneur, for me to invest in print as well as online, uh, 
economically online works better, number one. Number two, when I'm already getting the kind of reach that I have in online, I don't see a reason to go into print. Because I have readers uh, in my city, across the country, as well as in countries abroad who are reading my magazine. Um, I don't see a need to go into print because I'm reaching the people I want to reach just this way. So why would I then invest in print? I'd uh, like to ask you, uh, as a brand, you know, if you want to create a brand, do you think that some kind of physical uh, imprint is important? Is it? Uh, can you do a lot with a digital magazine and also make a good brand out of it? Um, it's working pretty fine in these last six months because uh, online in in the social media space, which is what I have used mainly to market my uh, magazine, uh, there seems to be a good following. People recognize the name now. People recognize the logo now. Uh, in fact, I get people approach me to do put in information about their social causes. So obviously, they're hearing about it from somewhere. I think uh, what would help even further uh, would to do for me would be to do on ground marketing. But to bring out a print version doesn't really make a difference to my brand because essentially it started off as an online brand and. That's, that's what it's going to be. So it, it, it was never intended to be a print brand or an on-ground brand. What will help though is to do on-ground activities to establish it or give it better visibility in the local area. Um, I think that one of the things that we see in, 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 in our work is that, and, it, and it's quite evident here as well, is that different <laughs> markets or different uh, communities or different contexts are uh, approaching the online world in terms of reading in different ways. Um, in the UK, I think that we have a severe problem because I think that our market is over dominated by Amazon and the Kindle. And the repercussions on a small language community like Welsh um, is, is quite enormous. Amazon, uh, there are a number of Welsh language books available on Amazon, the sales are not huge, but they kind of slip through and they'd be classified as English language books. Recently, Amazon made a, a, a statement that they were going to concentrate on only the six major languages as they define them in publishing. And therefore, Welsh language publishers who want to produce uh, a, a, a Kindle version of their books is not able to do that anymore. Um, okay, they're in negotiation and they're trying to generate uh, bad publicity for Amazon as a way of trying to get them, you know, to, to retract that. But because our technology market is dominated by the Kindle, because Amazon is blocking a language to get onto the Kindle, it means that if you want to read Welsh language novels, you can't really do it using a Kindle. And because we have an over-dominance or a monopoly of the, of the technology market, it stifles the growth of e-reading in Welsh. And the reason that Amazon have given for, for their decision, as far as I understand at least, is that they need to be responsible for the content. They don't have the, in, uh, the in-house services to be able to support Welsh language publishing. They don't know where to truck the case, they can't say whether whether the, um, the electronic version is a correct version of the book and so on and so forth and other kinds of legal <coughs> issues. Well, what does that, that to me says that Amazon thinks of itself as the publisher, not just the distributor. And I see that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a real big, big fan of, of online stuff, but I think that we sometimes can get too engrossed in the dream that it's a really, it's a leveling ground it's not a leveling ground. There are the same kinds of hierarchies that exist in the analog world in the digital world. Wow. But we can fight together. Um, just following on from what um, Ellen said, so I think that the common thread here is that um, digital is, I think, uh, and, and Chetner is proving that it's possible, it is a fantastic way of getting content that otherwise wouldn't get anywhere out to market. It's, it's an absolutely brilliant way of opening up, uh, we had a panel on it, uh, independent publishers yesterday, it's a brilliant way of opening up the kind of content that independent publishers has, and Paul has said earlier that for him, um, digital is a great leveling field. 
Uh, and I think that's true, and it's my great hope that for alternative forms of publishing and independent forms of publishing, digital is uh, going to be an extremely good thing. There are two problems in, that sort of build on what Ellen said uh, with digital that I think make it a troubling place as well as a very promising place. Um, the first one is that we still haven't fully figured out how, in the absence of uh, bricks and mortar bookstores, we put our books in front of people. Um, I'm not sure what proportion of book and indeed magazine sales come from just serendipitous uh, discovery in a shop, but it's actually quite large. And we have metadata, we have social media marketing, um, we have search discovery, we have all these kind of mechanisms. But for me, there's still an element that's slightly missing. So we still haven't fully worked out how to find and sell niche content in what is profitable amounts online. The second problem is this, exactly what um, Ellen says, is this dominance of certain platforms and the hierarchy that they create. And what you see on, say, the Kindle and on all digital platforms to a certain extent is a feedback effect. So here's how it works. Let's say you get good promotion uh, from Amazon. Your book is on the Kindle. It's being promoted. People aren't really looking much on their Kindle. They just go to the front page and buy what's there. That drives your book up the charts. So you're in the charts. People are looking at the charts. Because you're in the charts, you get more promotion. Because you get more promotion, you stay in the charts, and so on and so on. And what that means is the Kindle chart, compared to even the book chart, is actually very static. Books get stuck in the top 10, and they stay there. Because actually what the, the platform does is create a feedback loop. And that favors those publishers who are able to crack into those feedback loops. And more often than not, those publishers won't be alternative. So I think digital media is a fantastic opportunity, but we have to be aware that it comes with a new set of challenges that can inhibit in, uh, alternative or independent publishing. What you said, um, isn't alternate publishing more about alternate media? Uh, and I'm presuming they also mean the technology out here. You guys have taken the conscious decision to not go where everybody's saying, you should go digital. And you said, no, you don't, not going to go digital. What, uh, you know, e, have you had second thoughts about that? Do you think you made the right decision? What do you plan to do? And why did you take this decision? Uh, I, one of you put it very well today, that alternate media is, uh, alternate publishing is not just about alternate <coughs> media, it's about alternate content. You know, things that the major publishers, perhaps in your opinion, went to. So, what were the gaps that you saw? Why did you take these decisions? Both of you one after the other, please. I think uh, both Kindle and Reading are, are also online, but uh, predominantly they are uh, traditional print models. And uh, speaking about Kindle, why I feel it's alternative is because uh, it's again a youth magazine, but if you go through the content, then, uh, and this is a feedback we get from our readers, is that any other youth magazine doesn't cover the kind of topics that we cover. It doesn't, you know, delve on the kind of issues that we delve in. And we have also, you know, to ensure that our magazine reaches the youth. Very briefly, what issues, what topics? If you could just outline, say, three of them. I, I mean, just give me the names. You know, it's just the kind of, uh, we would do regular interviews, but the kind of people who we would interview would be different. So, say we would interview maybe Fatima Bhutto instead of Chetan Bhagat as a uh, in terms of authors, or we would do a very offbeat film review as, you know, against a regular film review, or things like that. So basically, in terms of content, we uh, tend to position ourselves a little differently. And the distribution model that we've taken is a very direct distribution model. We have a large subscription base. So uh, how we do it is that we go directly to schools and colleges. Uh, we do a lot of workshops with them workshops which are related to uh, literary topics like say public speaking or theater or creative writing. We ensure that whoever does the workshop gets a subscription of the magazine. So in that sense, our magazine is reaching our target group very, very directly. Of course, we do have a sales model where we are selling through stores and through uh, Our target group is getting to read our kind of content. 
product our magazine is only print but uh, you know i mean the shops are you know obviously it's the print version but we do give uh, overseas subscribers uh, the pdf option because uh, obviously we explore the condition thing and uh, uh, apart from that we kind of keep uh, connecting with readers using these uh, using social media a lot actually so we we, uh, we use facebook as a kind of to entice readers to the website and uh, on our website we uh, periodically put up uh, you know stories uh, or articles uh, which are relevant from our older issues or sometimes even the current issue and the shorter poetry we put it up directly on facebook and uh, it really creates quite a stir you know i mean for all those people <coughs> that nobody reads poetry I and mean, even on facebook they do and uh, uh, so in that sense it's kind of a hybrid model though the, the entire magazine of course is not available online as an issue Uh, which we we could probably do in the second year, like some of the older issues. We are exploring that surely, you know, that the older issues will be available in archives uh, in entirety. Uh, and, um, yeah, but not. There are quite a number of people here who run small publishing houses, alternate houses. I know of at least two or three. I know Himant Pitta is here, Fred is here, uh, Dikash Yogi was here yesterday on a piece of ground. Smaller houses who are doing things that. The larger houses, perhaps, are not. Uh, would how many of you would define yourselves as being among this crowd uh, of people, the alternate publishers? I am letting you define. I am saying, do you define yourselves as alternate publishers? Two years back, we were small. Two years back, October was small and now big. I am not <laughs> defining it. I am asking you yeah. to define it for yourselves. Do you consider yourselves alternate publishers? Uh, in a sense, in a sense, we do. All right. And the show of hands, show of hands, please. All right. Mika also had his hand up. A little earlier, he publishes a web. Uh, what do you call it? A portal from the old from the old days. <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, that's it. Right. Um, from those of you who find yourselves as alternate publishers, uh, could you take and very quickly, in like a sentence each, uh, if you raise your hand so you catch his eye, in a sentence each, what, why do you define yourselves as alternate publishers? Could you tell us that? Uh, start with Fred out there. He had his hand up right at the beginning. Just a sentence. Why do you consider yourself alternate? Uh, this may sound very unprofessional, but the goal is not profit. The goal is not profit, is what he said. Uh, next, anyone? Yeah. Because we publish things that other people would not. The lady in white next to the door. You have a joint up. Publish which uh, we we discover we're more innovative, we nurture authors more, uh, but there is a link to the mainstream in that those authors then once established the mainstream sits up and then takes them over. So that it is like a continuum. We are not you know an island somewhere, right. but, but we do develop new authors. A lot of emphasis there. In the second row behind the door, the gentleman in the corner there. Opinion is uh, that alternate publishing is about. Uh, another, another do you define yourself as an alternate publisher? No, no. Oh, okay. I, just, I want to hear from the people. I want to hear from the people who define themselves as alternate publishers. We publish in nine languages monthly for the publisher, and uh, well, uh, constantly discovering uh, authors, illustrators. Okay, so so far I'm hearing we're not in it to make money. We're doing we alternate because we're taking subjects that other people aren't willing to handle. Or we're doing multiple languages which uh, the mainstream publishers aren't willing to handle. Uh, perhaps taking risks on new writers uh, is an important part of this. What else? Uh, you also do some alternate publishing, whether you're not a mainstream publisher. I am a mainstream, but I do some alternate publishing too. 
Like we need a set of books. So what do you define so as alternate? No, that would be, yes, yeah, some of it is not totally. What part of it makes you say that okay, partly I do alternate okay, publishing? There's, there's a set of books, Hindi readers, Hindi books, which are based with stories based on the 16 different dialects of Hindi. Nobody would dream of publishing or printing, but it would not sell. So you're, you're, you're saying the part of the alternate definition for you yes, is that you, you publish in languages that the no, languages. Language is an idea like the, the 16 dialects of Hindi, 20 dialects of Hindi, a story in a dialect. It's something which is not for the main market, it did not sell at all. The first thing. So yeah, so in languages that publishers do not think are commercially viable? Dialects, not languages. Hindi, there's a lot of Hindi publishing going on there. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, we saw ourselves when we began as an alternative uh, to the mainstream news that was being covered. I mean, to the news that was being covered in the mainstream. The mainstream yes. wasn't covering all the news that you talked about. This is the niche. In terms of focus, in terms of depth, in terms of involving the community uh, that we focus on in, in creating new content and understanding them better, we saw ourselves as an alternative. And speed of delivery. And the speed of delivery. Yes. Anyone else who defines themselves as alternate? Right at the very back. You want to pick a fight today, no matter what. No fights. No, the person concerned should have been here. She was supposed to be attending. This is a, a, a venture called shonakotha.com. It's in Bengali. What it literally means is things that I've heard. It's an audio uh, short story site. What they do is they take stories which are out of copyright at the moment. They record them in a very professional way and they have put them out on their website for people to download for a price. They are also making it available on mobile networks for people to dial in and listen. Would you consider that an example of what is happening? You're talking about you here, I mean, I was yeah. wondering to hear so if yeah, I was that, in that media, media, and that's a different that's way. That's an interesting model. Yeah. To take the oral storytelling tradition, uh, marry it with the guys who are out of copyright and use new technology to deliver it. Uh, with the microphone, the lady here, fourth row. I can hear you, but the others can't, man, so. Uh, just, you turn it off. All the way to the top. All the way to the top. All the way to the top. Sorry. I'm obviously taking the wrong. Okay, just a word of advice. When you guys get the mic, he knows what he's doing. Don't touch the switch. He's giving it to you on. Okay? If he doesn't give it to you on, we kick his butt. Alright? Okay, so just to, uh, I mean, uh, I, to answer the question of alternate forms of publishing, I think we've done some alternate ways of making a book. Okay? For instance, uh, for instance there's one book that, it's a book project we're really working on just now, uh, which is a book that is going to be coming out of a series of conversations between practitioners of the arts, different arts. And all we're doing is we're transcribing those. So it's a multiple authored, but based on an oral narrative of today. It's, it's not to do with, that's one way of doing a book. Another uh, alternate uh, that we have, I mean, we're not sure about, about the success or failure of these books. So I'm talking about current projects. Uh, in journal publishing, I've been associated with journals as well, um, and there is currently an academic journal of agrarian studies, uh, which uh, we are bringing out a digital online free edition first, to be followed by a print version, limited numbers, on subscription base. And I think this is, correct me if I'm wrong please, I think this is the first in India definitely. And I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see how it goes in good college situations. Uh, Ma'am, Ma I have a question for you. This agrarian journal, is it for farmers or for the policy makers? In fact, I'm glad you asked me the question. And the reason why the uh, form has taken this form is because the agrarian journal is an academic journal meant for researchers, no, meant for researchers and academics and scholars working in on the agrarian economy of India and developed countries, as well as activists who are working out there. So the print version is going to be a cheaper print edition to reach those people out there in small villages, towns, etc. at a reasonable price. Uh, hopefully will also be translated into the language of the region, 
we tie up with organizations to do that. And the online edition goes to the larger international academic market. One thing I think about uh, alternate publishing is that uh, it's very easy for anyone to be an alternate publisher. But equally, in a way, everyone is an alternate publisher if you so define yourself. Um, because I think one thing that we're seeing is that people can say, uh, oh, we are publishing uh, content that no one else will publish. But every publisher publishes content that no one else will publish somewhere along the line. So uh, for me, actually, uh, alternate publishing uh, has to be something more. So radical. then you define this as, OK, if you've been to five publishers and they haven't touched it, and then you publish it, then it's alternate publishing can be. That's what I think we should avoid, and that's what it sounds like. If no one else will publish it, maybe it's not very good, and we shouldn't be publishing it at all. Um, so actually, for me, alternative publishing, um, really, if we're going to a deep level, has to be something a bit more transformative than um, uh, simply uh, it's interesting content. Because I think interesting, difficult, challenging uh, content is what all publishers should be doing. And I think um, I'm no defender of big corporates, but they actually do do some of that publishing as well. Um, so for me, alternative publishing is something that has to go much deeper and really challenges the very basic assumptions about what it is a publishing house does or should do or is. Sure. You know, I agree with what Michael is saying, that you know, you've got to take, take the difficult things and then take that step. But I think in alternate publishing, it, more than uh, taking that first step, it's about sustaining. So a lot of people, considering the technology today and considering everything that's available, it's very easy to start something, but then how can you sustain it? I mean, that's, that's what actually comes up in alternate publishing. To be able to start something and sustain it and take it through. Yeah. Uh, two questions, uh, really. One, two, one, two, and three of you, Jim and Michael. Uh, I'm leaving you out of this right now because you've made the decision to go the other way. The thing that we haven't uh, <laughs> talked about at this stage so far is, you know, uh, I'd like, to, like you to expand a little bit on the technology front as well, and how that permits uh, alternate, you, you know, you started out by saying publishing, not just books, you do games, you, do, you know, other things. So just a little bit about uh, technology and what it's permitting publishing to do. Uh, and the second question, uh, has she run away? Nah, she's hiding there at the back. Okay, she's, she's carrying the burden of big publishing for all of us. Uh, at some point, Vipika, we, we come back to you, and I want to know what you think. Okay, and you will be speaking for all of big publishing. Um, what do you think of alternate publishing? Okay, but we come back to that. Gather your thoughts. Fair warning. Okay, fair warning, and we just talk about tech for a bit, and then bounce on you. Before we go into technology, uh, I think the first thing I'd like to just quickly get out of the way is that I in no way believe that um, print books are going to die. And I, I've had that discussion so many times. And uh, a lot of people assume that because I'm a digital publisher, uh, that I believe that somehow print is redundant or old. And I absolutely don't believe that. I, I believe um, we'll always have a mixed environment of print books, print magazines, uh, and so on, but also digital products. I, I don't know how much the proportions will be on one side or another. We certainly know that digital is here, and we know that the trajectory of that is telling us that it will be an increasing proportion of content will be consumed in digital, and indeed already is. Um, but, you know, before I say anything else, I should say that I don't believe print books are just going to disappear. Uh, I think they will stay, and they will always have a role. Um, perhaps a slightly lessened role, uh, but they will nonetheless be there. Um, even so, uh, I think the question was, what, what does the technology permit? Um, essentially, it permits anything. So, uh, you know, you can almost now, on, on an app store, let's say, there's almost every media form that exists in the world today is there. Every media producer in the world is there in some form, doing every kind of entertainment or information gathering exercises. So, actually, the real challenge is not what the technology permits, but it's how you choose to use the technology and what decisions you're going to make about the application of it. Because it is so open and because it is so crowded, that means the competition is so much fiercer. Um, in a bookshop, 
you're essentially finding other books for people's attention and for people's money. On an app store, you're not just competing with other books, you're competing with films, games, uh, marketing exercises from multimedia companies, um, anything and everything. Um, so actually, for me, the difficult thing is whittling it down to the one or two things that you're a specialist in, and then deciding, right, this is something perhaps radically different in terms of the nature of what it is, but it's nonetheless within our kind of expertise. It's within our, um, it, it's within what, what we already know. And I'll, I'll give you one quick example. So we published uh, in January of this year a sort of business guidebook called The Decision Book, which is essentially a kind of a guide to 50 different business models. Um, and we partnered up with a startup company called Cognition, who's developed software that maps books into graphs and trees. It's very difficult to describe. And essentially, they made this book about business models and turned it into an interactive journey through the business models where you would feed in your own information and then it would sort of automatically construct these business models for you um, as you go through the software. And so actually what this was is, is a program. It's not really a book at all, but it was based on the book and we were the publisher. So we realized the book was going to be successful. This had a good chance. And so it was reimagining what it could be. But the point was is we did that project and not any other because the technology permits everything, money permitting. So Rob, do you think that, uh, I mean, going using technology is not just about doing the digital version of the book, but merely tries to replicate the paper experience, but to see what else media lets you do, to go to that broad thing that way back in the 90s everybody was talking about, convergence. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just quickly go, because I don't want to monopolize. Um, so I think the first publishers actually have been in a digital revolution probably since uh, the late 70s. Um, and until recently, every single stage of the publishing process was digital, apart from the end product. The, the, the file would come in from a writer in a Word document, it would then be edited on computers, sent around on computers, and actually the only time the product and the whole workflow of a publisher wasn't digital was actually at the very last point, when it's printed. And now what we've seen in this latest phase is that instead of there being a print product at the end, there's a file at the end. And so the first, the last sort of part of this basic jigsaw of publishing was just creating a, a fully digital workflow rather than a workflow that was digital apart from at the very end. And to me, that's what I've spent the past few years mainly doing, essentially putting in this, this last final piece of the digital publishers for uh, digital puzzle for publishers, which was mentally has been, I think, a bit of a struggle for a lot of publishers because they so associated with the end product, even though it was only the end product and they were used to dealing with digital files on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's been actually, to my mind, not a particularly radical exercise. To my mind, that's a kind of very basic next step. You've got a book, you've got an e-book. Actually, it still has to go through production, there's still editorial, it still has to be sold through usual sales channels, it still goes through all of those embedded processes, it still needs copy editing, etc. etc. So actually when we're talking about ebooks, ebooks are they're, they're not a, a great change. In fact, people have worked very hard to make them not be a great change. But now I think we're coming to the stage where everyone, and some people have been thinking about this for a long time, but everyone needs to start thinking about the digital things that are not based on a book, that are not just simply uh, facsimiles of books, that are not just books with little bells and whistles on the side, that are actually conceived of as being fully natively digital products. Um, and to me, that's where the radical side lies. That's where the real alternate publishing will come from. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's very exciting. Kind of following up from that as well, um, we've been publishing this uh, review of, of, of writing and promoting translation, uh, creative translation, it, it's called Transcript, and we've been publishing it for about uh, eight years now. And it is really an electronic facsimile, if you like, of a print, of a printed uh, online, uh, a printed review, in the sense that it doesn't really take advantage of any of the other uh, facilities uh, available to you when you do digital stuff. But of course, over time, it's become something else as well. It's become a database, not quite as large as the Oxford English Dictionary, but it's become a database because of the searchability of past issues. And one of the problems that we've uh, been looking at in, in our work environment is 
we wanted to move into web 2, as we used to call it, with everybody thinking of being online as part of their job description, if you like. So if you were responsible for the magazine, you would be tweeting about the magazine. If you were organizing a translation workshop, you'd be tweeting about that. And I was really, really, you know, um, totally, totally convinced that it had to be everybody's job. It couldn't be a single person's job. The social communication. Something, something came up in the last session yeah. yesterday yeah. as well about taking <laughs> kid ownership yeah. rather than but putting more. it into silence. Yeah, there's, there's more because I was really interested in what was being said yesterday. The team, however, didn't want to do that. Some people were afraid of it. They didn't want to do it. They didn't want to learn the, the technology. Some people thought, why should I be an online person? I don't want to be an online person, thank you very much. I'm a private person. I'm perfectly, perfectly I'm happy to do public things under my conditions, but I don't want to be a 24-7 online person. And other people just didn't know how to do it. And then a few other people said, yeah, OK, we'll do it. So I was really, this is useless, you know. Ah. Never mind, I have to go with, with what people wanted. Of course, now, so, so we did the silo thing, but of course the silo sort of spread out and everybody started joining the silo and in the end, everybody's doing it. Not to the same degree, but it just shows the kind of process that sometimes you have to go through, that you can't jump from one context to the other. And what we want to do now with the online review is that it does sort of take on a little bit more interactivity or negotiation. And in a sense, it's part of a strategy of building a community. Because when I said at the beginning, I've always considered myself to be a, a non-traditionalist or a non-mainstream person. That's really because nobody has ever told me, why don't you, know, why don't you do this? Why don't you set up what I've actually set up? I've always done it kind of against the grain, you know, or against all odds type of thing. Nobody said to me in the, you know, in the early 90s, why don't you set up a research center that's really interested in minority languages, media, and European and worldwide exchange? Why don't you do that, Ellen? No, 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 nobody said that because nobody wanted to do it. Nobody thought that there was any need to do it. And in a sense, it's a little bit about how people were defining themselves as alternate publishers just now. It's doing really what nobody will tell you to do. It's about creating something new. New. It's not about spotting a gap in the market. It's about making that gap. It's about being proactive. And I think that was, that was one of the things that I found that sort of brought people together. For us who are working in languages other than English, it's really, really much more difficult. You can define yourself as an alternate just by not doing it in a major language. And for us, I think that the challenge that we have with technology is, yes, we can use some languages very easily for, for technology, but other languages are finding it more difficult to make themselves present on that platform. What we have um, that we find that's really, really important, it's important for linguistic diversity and diversity in literature to, to travel. So it's important for um, language, uh, literature, say, in Catalan or Turkish or whatever, to travel into other languages. But in our experience as well, it's equally important for smaller languages to translate works into those languages as well. It's not just about external projection of your own culture, it's about enhancing the intellectual possibilities within your own speech community. And I think that if you lose the translation into a language, you are really making that language less useful for the future. And equally, if you don't have languages on electronic platforms, then when we move to communicating more and more and more through electronic means, then those languages become less and less useful and finally obsolete. When you ask what does technology permit, I think the way she put it in terms of saying that it helps language, you need to get language out there. Um, I'd like to cite Tulikar's example yesterday, the children's book that you showed, which was, you know, the poems that were, it, it was an audio book which had a visual appeal to it, um, and you had translations in different languages. So 
all that happens because you have accepted a kind of technology and said let's go with it. So one thing that technology allows for is to make something far more interactive than what it is in print. Not that print is not enjoyable. I still love the smell of books. But <laughs> this is just... Page and okay. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but this, it, it makes it far more interactive that way. Uh, the other thing that uh, happens with technology is you get immediate response. Today when I put up the magazine, uh, it takes half an hour for people to tweet back or get onto Facebook and write a message back saying they don't like the next story or they like the issue or they want someone else to read the story. That immediate response you don't get in print, which technology allows for. Um, I don't see a reason why the both can't coexist. There's this whole notion of one has to replace the other when in fact it can actually just coexist. Maybe one takes a back seat at one time and the other one, you know, the online becomes stronger or then online takes a back seat for some people and print becomes stronger, but the two can coexist. It's about finding the combination. You know, storytelling per se and using the, uh, you know, there are people who are trying to force fit in the same way as, you know, say you're just taking the page and putting yeah. it in an electronic version. But there's also people who are not exploring the, uh, I don't find enough people who are exploring the ways in which you can use simple things online to say tell a story, to use it's very basic uh, hy you know, hypertext to link on. I remember way back in the, it was about uh, late 90s, I was part of a forum, an online forum for writers called Trace, which was run out of Nottingham Trent University. Uh, brilliant set of people from there, some of whom I was still in touch with. And they were doing this huge amount of interesting things with using, there's a poem that I remember that we're going to mention up there. It's not a poem, it's not an uh, illustrative piece. It's called My Boyfriend Came Back From The War. It's something that I remember distinctly. Look up, my boyfriend came up, came back from the war. Beautiful piece of online HTML storytelling, compact, interesting, something you cannot do in print. So, you know, I'm, I'm personally looking for a lot of stuff for things that also for me is to be able to do things that print can't do, right? Not just be another way to take your print out there. A print uh, can lie... Aside from the scratch stick part. <laughs> a print can just lie on a bookshelf for years and years and just be seen there. A digital just goes out of your head as soon as it comes in. And on my desktop for years and years. Okay. <laughs> Data never dies, paper disintegrates. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I detect <laughs> controversy. <laughs> yes. Sally, what's okay? Wake up. We'll come back to you just a moment, Matt. Can we just let Fred speak, please? Uh, at this point of time in our country, it's the most democratic medium. So let's not accept arguments that say that, you know, uh, uh, costly, <coughs> labor is not costly here, printing is not costly here. Which technology reaches so many people so inexpensively? Not, not, not yet, not yet yet. Like, the mobile. No, I, not even the I'm deeply yeah. invested in print. My salary comes from a print magazine. <laughs> <laughs> so there is something in print which the e-books cannot do with print can The microphone for the lady, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For example, an activity in a children's book, cut out of the dotted line, close it and make something. That you can't do. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, 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 Right there at the back was Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, just an observation. About, uh, I think it's a little dangerous to assume that digital is permanent for two reasons. One is that if you look at the archives on the web, everything from 1992 to roughly about 1996 is very, very hard to access. Uh, I used to track something called ghost sites. And you'd be surprised at the numbers of uh, things you think of the used billets as their email account knows that archives die. Second thing, and I think this feeds into a point that was being made earlier, is that it's a little dangerous to trust, uh, I mean, I'm getting the enthusiast uh, switch to doing most of my reading online a long time ago. Uh, but I find it very uh, uh, 
Uh, I'm not driven that Amazon and Google own so much of our print and future publishing space. You know, Amazon has relieved the books from their library. Uh, neither Google nor Amazon are particularly uh, clear about what they're going to do in countries like China. Are they going to continue with the censorship routine? And the problem is that new technologies make it a lot easier to make things invisible. I'm coming at this strictly from a free speech point of view. But I think, you know, when we're discussing alternative uh, publishing, one of the things that alternative publishers are very good at doing is keeping a certain set of ideas in circulation, usually ideas that the mainstream doesn't want to hear. Yeah. Right at the back, and then the gentleman on the painting. Small, uh, again, a small case study. This is, again, a thing we've been tracking in Jhaka, where there's a thing called Dupont, the multinational that produce a non shareable paper, which is also waterproof for Tibet. And they've been using it for ration cards in Bihar because they found the ration cards had an expiry date. Uh, it's been very successful over there. And now they're using that same paper, or they're trying, and they're going to subsidize education uh, by producing textbooks with that. I mean, as you know, in India, you know, books never, we don't throw anything away. So the next generation and the generation comes back. If you can wet the book, you can, I mean, the paper is by and large non terrible means that typically even a school textbook, because you know we're not able to produce enough, will be sort of having a lifespan of five, six, seven years, unless the child you know struggles all over it. So I mean there are interesting initiatives which are taking place and which are sort of common sense and alternative. Uh, the gentleman here under the painting. Hi, this just to uh, expand the comment that Anjana just made about uh, perishability of data. I mean, let's also not forget that technology is perishable. I mean, can you use floppy disks now? And, uh, so much stuff on floppy disks. Um, and um, I'm just reminded of a talk I attended by Nandan Nilekeni on you know, this UID project that he is heading. The biggest cost component of UID is on data storage. It's not on collection. So I mean, there's a massive, massive cost on data storage. And the cost is being incurred because the data is perishable. So let's not kid ourselves that, you know. Uh, but there is the fact that data storage has become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I mean, look, what took, uh, you know, a device the size of this room or more, uh, I can carry around in my pocket now. No, so that's getting better. I, I think uh, the perishability of data is something that we don't uh, easily sort of take into account. But data does deteriorate over a period of time for various environmental factors. The binary data deteriorates. You know, in whichever form you store it, unless you can sort of store it in, you know, highly controlled sort of. Now, see, one of the things that, uh, for instance, uh, if you follow things like WikiLeaks and uh, you know torrents and things like that, the fact of distributing your data and having it appear in multiple places, multiple backups all over the place, uh, does take care of a lot of that. And gentleman here wants to say something. You don't mind. Uh, what, what I like is uh, take the best of print and digital and put together and that's a great combination. In FIP, I had to travel to San Francisco and I uh, took the help of a site called Offbeat Guides and they asked me just uh, four simple questions. Where are you from in Chennai? Where are you going to San Jose in, um, in uh, uh, California? What date? I gave the date. And uh, what place are you going to stay exactly there? And accordingly, they gave me a 70 page beautifully customized um, guidebook that exactly talks about what are the events that happened that one weekend there, what are all the good places that I can go in and around uh, San Jose that I should go and visit, and uh, they gave it a beautiful design thing that I can, in a PDF file that I can take a print, and uh, it's a great example of using technology to customize, yet I have it as a print that I can carry me, uh, along with me, yes. and it's probably the most useful guidebook I ever bought in my life, and never am I ever going to go buy that big thing. Um, yeah, okay. uh, but this is an observation that an alternative to a print book in the case of a poetry piece could also be a performance of poetry. So I don't think we should look at alternate only as something that's new. There are other alternates that we've known of and we've rejected or just sort of lost along the way. The, uh, the danger with the sort of this whole digital debate and the years I've been seeing I write online, I write offline, so I'm familiar with both territories. And in online spaces and this whole culture of reviewing online law entries, I find that very difficult because I have, and in most cases, I write politically online. 
and I have an enormous amount of data coming my way, which has no background to the issue that is being discussed. It is feedback for me in a way that I understand how readers are not clued into so many issues. So it's feedback for me in that sense. But in sense of generating a debate, it can be extremely disruptive in, in blogs especially. And uh, if it's not moderated blogs, then you have, I mean, I've faced enormous kind of uh, males that attack me for being a woman, that attack me for being various other things which I'm not. So these kind of issues are existing. So when we talk about digital, if we discount these, uh, these occurrences, then we are not really looking at the big picture as well. Uh, apart from Fred, I presume everyone else here likes making money. So can I just ask, with, particularly with three of the ladies on the platform who are uh, who've gone the internet uh, route, what's the revenue model? Is there a revenue model? Uh, it's all very well to talk about alternative publishing, um, but is there money to be made in doing it as well? The, the revenue model that my magazine follows is ad sales. The issue, the challenge that I face is that it's a format that people don't understand because as of now, online ad sales are per click and per view. Whereas my magazine format is like a flip book and that does not make space for per click and per view. So it is a challenge that I'm trying to overcome. But like I said, it's easy to start. Sustaining it is the bigger challenge. We will overcome that challenge. Not yet. You have. When I'm coming to you. <laughs> Can I, can I just hear from Michael, you said you're running a subscription model, is that well? Uh, the subscription model works in the sense that it uh, funds our growth, so we don't have to put in more money to grow. But no, we're not making money yet, still putting in some amount of money. But the subscription model works before the ad model starts working. So yeah. that's where it helps, you know. With the, with the, online, model, with, with yeah. the online model that we have, um, the journal itself uh, operates in a business model that's based on the fact that we're a network organization. So the editor has very, very little commissioning money. So the content is provided through the network of organizations that belong to, to the network. And the fact that we're located about three hours from any major airport, well, any real airport, uh, means that you know whenever I travel, the worst three hours are the three hours back home. Um, but what it what it means in the business model is that you can operate uh, Europe-wide, and by now, uh, you know, uh, further than Europe-wide uh, uh, online magazine, uh, you know, from the complete back of beyond, you know, so. Our model really means that the content is provided through the activity that's created in any case um, in the different institutions and in the different publishing houses and in the different agencies that are part of the model. So, a parasite model. Uh, we took a call when we started that we will not take advertising for about... Uh, we took a call when we started that we won't take advertising for the first uh, year and a half. It was entirely bootstrap. We used that time to build up uh, uh, an audience base and also uh, make advertisers familiar with us. Uh, we had a specific target audience and we decided not to talk to the agencies, which I think uh, most online uh, sites have to do, because the agencies only operate on a per click or on a per impression model. Uh, our pitch to advertisers was that we um, we reach a specific set of, uh, a specific audience that meets uh, that 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 is their client base, and to build a brand, uh, to build uh, some kind of visibility, and in, in, in on a site that uh, is trying to help the ecosystem, uh, it just helps uh, in a positive brand recall for them. It's a very hard pitch, but we kept making it again and again and again. People came, they tried. The other suggestion that I received was that don't try and sell uh, every, uh, monthly deals. So we typically try to uh, try to sell six uh, deals for six months at a time, and uh, we incentivize long-term deals. So uh, we have a card rate, and we do not discount uh, under, uh, unless uh, we either get a prepayment because collections in the online advertising business is a real pain. 
So we give a discount on prepayment and we give a discount uh, if they take a long-term deal. And most people uh, opt for the long-term payment part, not many prepay, but okay. that's the way we've, we've worked it. And uh, we, uh, we haven't had too many advertisers, but we, most of them have been there for well over a year. So then it seems that they're happy with it. Thanks. Uh, the question is directed from the ladies, uh, Chetna Vaishali at uh, Maitri, uh, do you think your automated content in your magazines or your, uh, is it acting as a detriment to advertisers? For me, I think there are all kinds of people, you know, in the advertising circle. So, uh, definitely so anything which doesn't sell very easily is always a deterrent. Anything which is not very popular, as in popular culture, will not sell very easily. But yes, uh, to answer your question, it, it is sometimes a deterrent to advertise it. We face that now. yet proved a kind of commercially 
uh, stable, really, just that will definitely provide a sort of certain income uh, model that is beyond that. publisher who's going out and saying that, you know, I've published my 200 book or this is my third magazine. It's the first uh, thing that I've brought out into the market. So who am I? What is my credibility? So people are not going to pay for it, number one. Number two, um, the content, the subject is in, uh, it, it's about the social sector. So it's anyways an untapped market. So if I'm going to price, I don't know who's going to, I didn't know who was going to read it in the first place. Now, in six months, I know, yes, there are 2,000 people reading it, and they come from various walks of life and various age groups. But uh, I don't think pricing, if I price it, it only restricts my readership. Uh, I had the same fear, because that a lot of the queries we got for online versions were always prefixed with free. Isn't there a free online version? So the, the, I think in a lot of, maybe not true for UK and US, but in India, yeah. online needs the Because I have a day job, I sort of do this whenever I have the time. And I'm not saying that this is a business model, but I've had people saying, look, can we support you in some way so that you can have more time for this? All right, can we give you money? And there'll be a few people out of the, you know, 2,000 odd subscribers who go for the free newsletter, few people have offered. Uh, and I say, no, it's okay, you, I mean, uh, aside from the fact that I want a lot more money than you are willing to give me, uh, the fact is that I do this for fun, and it's just, you know, maybe someday one will monetize it, but there's no intention to. We are publishers. Hmm? We are in a business. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it has to find income. I'm sorry. Come on, come on. Yeah. So, we are not, I mean, we are having fun doing it, but at the same time, it needs to become, uh, you know, it needs to be monetized. Uh, yeah. Can I just add one thing? Bring the mic here while he's talking. Uh, I was just say, um, After that, the gentleman there. You know, there is this uh, this very clear issue that people uh, expect things to be free or nearly free uh, online. And one sort of intelligent solution is to uh, bundle digital and print goods together in the way that, say, um, a download code comes to the record, or in the way that uh, O'Reilly, a technical publisher, uh, has sort of different price points for ebooks, print books, and then a bundle of them both. And I think we'll see a lot more bundling of print and digital in the years to come. Uh, I just wanted to add a couple of points. Uh, uh, the decision that, I, that you have to take is that like, of all the readers that are coming on your site, how many can you think will convert into a paid model and will that make your business viable or not? Uh, given the, the low propensity to pay online and even for the, uh, for the B2B trade uh, business like us, I think it would be uh, low given 
that they will only pay for a value add. So a freemium model where some content is free, some content is paid, uh, is worth looking at. Uh, the second point was that the biggest problem in online uh, is actually in, in allowing people to make payments. It's extremely expensive and difficult uh, to integrate a payment gateway uh, uh, into your website today and the failure rates are extremely high. So until someone launches a plug and play uh, uh, payment model, uh, I think this discussion about free versus paid is not going to happen. Let there be an opportunity for us to make something pay. I don't think that's the idea. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, you know, when you talk about making people pay for instance, uh, people who would like music but pay for a ringtone, right? Uh, they pay for a ringtone to because they can't pirate it. Yeah, exactly. You know, not necessarily, you, uh, I'm not talking about just the color tunes and whatnot, but they will need to pay those small amounts. People have got the pricing right on some of those things. You pay a few bucks to have your phone ring in the latest catchy tune. Uh, Arnava will tell you that, uh, you know, the amount of people who would have taken our app down and uh, a whole lot of other phone people who, uh, you know, would manage to sell small amounts of, of things around there. Uh, they're learning and probably having to redefine a lot of these things as we go along. Uh, can we go here, then to Anish, and then to Fred? The cost per transaction is You don't want to say anything? Okay, can you go to, uh, you had your hand up, right? And I told you earlier, so sorry. After that, Anish, and then to Fred, please. Uh, just curious to know what uh, the linguistic patterns, these are for those of you who are operating within India. Uh, for example, Facebook offers six Indian languages, including English, and I think predominantly it's about 90% plus English usage. Uh, so, just wanted to know what's happening in the other, uh, you know, Indian languages, Kannada, Malayalam, Marathi, uh, Bengali, and whether there is a possibility of seeing that, uh, you know, an explosion in that in the online domain and you know, literary magazines and what, because there is a huge tradition of that in the print space. Whether we'll see that getting translated or there is a genuine bottleneck, and if so, what? Who wants to take that? Okay. Will you quickly say, does anyone in the audience want to answer that? Uh, I will speak for Hindi. There's a lot of bloggers uh, <coughs> and uh, people who use, uh, uh, they, they put out book reviews, they put out uh, film reviews. Uh, some, I mean, there, there's one site particularly, which is a great site actually, but it is also, it's a blog format. It's called mohalla.com. And uh, this person is, is, he has something, I don't know, some crazy number of hits a day, some you know, lakhs. And uh, so there is, they are using the space, I think, and it's really Facebook, I think, which is, uh, um, uh, you know, turned it because that's where, that's where they put out the, that's where they you know, put out the links and things like that. And it's, it's a massive, uh, it, they really want to say something on that. Yeah, basically, I mean, there's, there's, there's uh, literary uh, reviews, there's uh, news, there's, it's big. Hello. Um, in fact, um, there's a Hindi journalist, Ravish Kumar, who's doing something very interesting. He has a Facebook page and a, and a wall on which he, for a few months ago, started <coughs> serializing short stories, I think, uh, or something. And to his amazement, a lot of Hindi newspapers have started reproducing those, you know, whatever number of characters it allows you, 4, 20, whatever, they have started reproducing those as is and printing it, and then they keep sending him the checks when it's published. <laughs> 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 Phenomenal. We have about less than five minutes left, so very quickly, question, question, one, two. Just uh, a comment on that very interesting conversation Ramu you um, started. Um, I have a concern when we talk about Indian languages and then we stop at eight. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, there is something going on here that, you know, I mean, people from Manipur wouldn't be very happy if we said that, okay, we have Bangla, Tamil, Telugu, Marathi, etc. Let's talk about that. That's one thing. The other problem with digital content in India, I think, is why Mohalla.com, I haven't been to the site. Is, is it 
Does it use the Roman script or the Hindi script? It uses the Hindi script. Uh, uh, awful lot is going on in regional languages on the internet but using the Roman script. And I think there is a challenge to scriptural diversity in India with that. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Just to go back a point or two, you know, a lot of persons seem to have this uh, subconscious fear that one online, one online uh, copyright is going to be one that books so. But is that assumption really? Because my experience is that there are totally different audiences. On the contrary, it's painful to read a book online. So there's a good chance if you like it, you're going to buy it. Yeah. Uh, music people have, have uh, made this a fine art in that sense. So their point is like, we don't make money on music sales, isn't it? Because we are getting the opinions from it. Let's have, let's, let's build up a profile and let's have huge uh, things we can pay for. And then and, and we are, and we have to talk for free. Uh, someone asked about books. I mean, we, are, we use open access, the format of open access for one for books. So it was sponsored by a local theater academy. And even before the book was formally released, it was all over on the net and we were pirating it ourselves because we, were, we had no comments. So there are Problem with the concert model for writers is how many writers would you pay to go and hear them read, for instance? Just curious. Like, uh, I remember at some point last year, no, just to diverge from the point of you know, the concert model selling individual tracks. Uh, but, but, Anand but, at some point last year tweeted that this is the first year that his fees from appearances were more than he was making from the sales of his books. Uh, is there something the publishing can learn from, you know, that way, the way the Grateful Dead, for instance, form is it? Would like our music, and what you pay to come to our shows to do that would like, for instance. Uh, In uh, children's published in children's books, there's a strange thing happening. Schools are willing to pay for um, storytellers, <coughs> authors, um, you know, and, but they will not allow the books to be sold. I mean, they sell all kinds of things, but books can't be sold. <laughs> why, why is that? I don't know why that is. That's how they think. There are branded t-shirts on sports days. There's, uh, you know, shoes. and all kinds of things being sold. But books, what is the point in an author visiting if the author, you know, the books are not to be English or But schools and uh, most and to answer Ramu's question, there's a Malayalam, uh, Ruben, there's a Malayalam blog by a government teacher who has reviewed most of our Malayalam books and it's really been nice to get that kind of feedback and we could only get that as a blog. Fresh out of time, I think, right now. Do we have to cut this, Leo? Okay. Uh, we can continue this outside. The thing is that it's going to infringe on two very important things. One is the workshop that is scheduled to happen right now, and the second is lunch. All right. So thank you for your uh, questions. We hope that we uh, we were entertaining enough. For you know, we sat down, just take away the tables and let's sit down and chat. Uh, what do you prefer? This is for Leo's benefit. Do you prefer? This kind of chat, or do you prefer people sitting at tables and talking at you? Which one? Okay, uh, this this format. Except the mics. Yesterday's format. Yeah, we need more mics. Yeah, I'm cut, instant feedback. And cut, cut out cut out the distance. It's just so far away. I know, I know. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs>